Well, hey everyone, my name is Jason. I'm a pastor at The Way Church here in Vancouver, and we're so delighted that you found yourself on this message today. Before we jump into the message, however, I wanna tell you about The Way College. It's a four-year accredited degree designed to strengthen and prepare ministers for future church ministry in Canada. So if you have a passion to grow in discipleship, but also to be equipped for ministry, there are a number of ways you can be involved with the college. First, you can do it as a one-year program. Second, you can do all four years for an accredited degree, or you could do part-time studies with us. We have a lot of amazing things starting this fall, and we'd love for you to find out more. You can follow the link below or go to thewaycollege.ca. Tons of love and enjoy the message. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verse 1 through 11. Now the Passover of the Feast of the Unloved Bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold, to, sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. This is the word of the Lord. It's great to be here. Nice to see all of you. Um, thanks, worship team, for leading us in singing. I, there was a couple lines that resonated so deeply, uh, having been in this text for the last couple of weeks. One was just, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. This extravagant pouring out of all that we are for Christ, and a recognition that all we have is from him. But there's this one line, I almost want to just pray it over us as we begin. It's, it's what I'm praying we leave um, it's the prayer I hope we have in our hearts leaving this place. And it's just let the king of my heart be the echo of my days. I love that. Let the king of my heart, let the king of our hearts be the echo of our days. Amen. That's where we're going. Um, if you've been part of the way for a while, you will have noticed that there are a lot of Rebecca's around. Um, and they're amazing. Um, but we have a lot of Rebecca's, and not just Rebecca's in our church, but Rebecca's on our leadership team. We have Rebecca Corbin. We have Rebecca Corbett. That one gets really confusing. Um, a lot of clarifying conversation. Do we, anyway, uh, we have Rebecca Lewis, led worship this morning. We got Rebecca TD, now Rebecca Rowe, shout out, big wedding this last week. And uh, that's, that's big news. And, uh, but because these Rebecca's all lead in different ways at the church, it has created some confusion at times. Nicknames have been key. We figured it out, but you get what I'm saying. And when you study the Gospels, you will notice that there are a lot of Marys. Like, we have a Mary problem, if you will. Um, we've got Mary Magdalene. We've got Mary, Mother of Jesus. Big names. Big names. And then we've got Mary and Martha Mary. And this is just to name a few. There's even more Marys. And sometimes it can be hard to know which Mary we are talking about when we're reading the scriptures and when we're just talking about a Mary from scripture. But the text that we just heard, even though in this version of it just says a woman, uh, is almost certainly about Mary of Bethany, whose sister was Martha and whose brother was Lazarus. And the reason why we can be confident about this is um, is because Mark isn't the only one who tells this story. The story is also told in other Gospels, and most pointedly, I think, in the Gospel of John. 
chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. And in John, right before this story is told, is the whole story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. And in that account, there's real dialogue between Jesus and Mary and Martha, and then Lazarus is raised, and then really seamlessly it moves into chapter 12. And let me read it for you. It says, six days before the Passover, uh, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, classic Martha. There she goes again. Um, well, Lazarus was among, the, it's a real Bible Sunday school joke. Anyway, um, well, Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it out on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And so for this reason and others, it appears that the Mary who anoints Jesus in our text today is this same Mary who witnessed her brother being raised from the dead not long before. And also, it's the same Mary who in Luke chapter 10 is found sitting at Jesus' feet, listening attentively to him. And then it's that scene where her sister Martha is complaining because uh, Martha's like, what, Jesus, aren't you just going to tell her to help me out? And in this story, um, Jesus responds to Martha and says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things or, are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And I think there's a similar tone in the text today. In both stories, Mary's rebuked, but in both stories, Jesus affirms what she's chosen. Striking, isn't it? She's praised as the one who's done what's best, as one who's done a beautiful thing, as the one who's chosen rightly. And what I want to emphasize right at the beginning today is just this, that I, I think for these reasons alone, Mary is a disciple worth listening to. Mary's a disciple worth learning from. And so today we're going to walk through the story together, make a number of observations. I always encourage, have the Bible open. If you have a Bible with you to the story, it's where we're grounded. Um, or if you have it on your phone, you can pull it up on an app. And I've organized uh, the teaching today into three sections. These are what they are. One, uh, we're going to look at Mary's appropriate response to Jesus. Secondly, we're going to look at Jesus' appropriate response to Mary. And then thirdly, going to venture to ponder what our appropriate response to this story might be. So point one, uh, section one, we're going to talk about Mary's appropriate response to Jesus. Um, so again, Jesus, we see, is stopping in for dinner at Simon's house in Bethany on his way to Jerusalem. And that's where the scene begins. People gathered in a home for a meal. And I wasn't aware of this prior to studying the passage, but anointing was common at feasts in the ancient world. For most of us, the whole scene feels foreign. Anointing, perfume, the whole, the whole, the whole thing. Um, but contextually, if Mary had taken a little perfume and anointed Jesus with a smaller amount— it would have been seen as something closer to common courtesy. Culturally, this would have made sense. And by, by studying the context, we learned that anointing was um, at least partially an act. It was about honoring someone, showing respect. It was special, but it, in a way it was common. And Jesus was no doubt, I mean, deeply respected and loved. He just raised Mary Martha's brother from the dead. I mean, he was deserving of gifts and honor. Uh, it really made sense, generally speaking, to show him affection and attention. But Mary does something that was not common. Look at verse 3 again. We read that she brought an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages. A year's wages is no common gift. We can get there. You know, that's extravagant. Uh, no doubt it got people's attention. The gift is shocking. And I honestly think assessing the gift is a bit over the top is a seemingly fair judgment of the situation. Lots of you have been at the, 
the party or been to the Christmas gift exchange where someone just goes a bit overboard, you know, like they don't stick within budget. Uh, when I was a kid and a young teen or teenager, uh, my mom would host annual Valentine's Day parties. I'm not sure if that was part of your annual rhythm, um, but for us at the Kings, it was big, it's a big thing. And my mom loves throwing parties in general, but these Valentine's Day parties were a huge hit, huge hit. And one of the things we did each year was we exchanged Valentine's Day cards, and they were tame. We were young, it was a chill, it was chill. But when I was 13, there was a girl that I liked a lot, but a few of us liked her. You know how that goes. You get it. Um, and so there's some extra nerves on this Valentine's Day, and we're going around the circle, giving out cards as we would, but then this one guy who liked her gives her a card, but then pulls out these two beanie babies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What? Box of Purdy's chocolate, bouquet of flowers. And we were rattled. I mean, we were rattled. This is like, what's going on? There was no question that something was being communicated more than happy Valentine's Day fellow 13-year-olds. You know what I'm saying? It's like, all right. Anyway, though we all scoffed, the thing worked out for him pretty well. He's laughing now. They got married years later. And um, true story. And honestly, I'm not really sure about the scene these days, single guys, but in 2002, Beanie Babies box of chocolates really did the trick. Um, So... Uh, The point is that we can resonate with extravagance, and at times we can deem things overkill. We get that idea, and that's what we're meant to see here. If we read the text in context, we should be wowed not by the general act, but by the fact that her gift was so extravagant, so radical that it caused internal conflict for people. Like, we feel that in the text. It was deep. They're like, this is wasteful. This should be given to the poor. Like, you feel that in the room, in the dialogue. And though Jesus was Jesus, the gift still begs the question, why so much? And was this appropriate? Was this appropriate? In our study in the Gospel of Mark, we talked a lot about this idea of messianic expectation. The hope that Jesus of Nazareth was in fact who Israel had been waiting for. The savior they'd been praying for, longing for. The king that had been prophesied come to save them from generations of oppressive rule. And I think Mary wasn't just pouring out this gift because of her affection for Jesus, though she no doubt loved him. And I I don't think her gift is just because she's so thankful that her brother had been raised from the dead, though that is no doubt worthy of a wonderful gift and and praise. I believe that she was pouring out this kind of extravagance because Mary saw this Jesus as her king. Not just her king, but the king who'd come to rescue and save. And in that room that day, Before Jesus went to the cross, Mary anoints the one she saw as the Christ, the anointed of God. What an an image. There's no doubt about this. In fact, in the story right before that I've referenced a few times, the story of Lazarus uh, being raised, um, while the dialogue's happening before he's been raised, uh, there's... Martha acknowledges, yeah, I believe you're the Christ, the son of, the son of God. This is pre him being raised. So no doubt both Martha and Mary firmly believed this was the Messiah. This was the king who'd come, who was coming to save them. And so their posture was their king had come. Uh, while I was prepping this talk, I thought of that Christmas song, The Little Drummer Boy. Great song. Uh, not many lyrics, a lot of pum pum pums But the essence of the song is this, like, What I have, I will bring. Why? Because I'm in the presence of the real king. You know, so all all I've got is a drum, but I'll play my best for him. I'll bring what I do have. And an awareness of the true king leads to this kind of response. Whatever I have, I'll bring him. And this gift of pure nard is what Mary had. It's what felt appropriate for a king, for her king. And so she pours it all out on him, lavishly, extravagantly. But not only does Mary see Jesus as her king, I think it's likely that Mary knew Jesus, her king, was about to die. We hear Jesus reference that idea. 
that somehow death was going to be mysteriously part of his ministry. And though it's not perfectly clear, I think she knew that she was anointing him for burial and saw her gift as a way of honoring the sacrificial kingly steps he would take in the scenes to follow. The other disciples missed this over and over again, even though Jesus predicted his death numerous times. He'd talked about it. He'd taught on it. He proclaimed it. But there was a general blindness to the fact that his death was actually part of the plan, though he said it was. But I guess the question here, because it's not all crystal clear, is could Mary have seen what others did not? Some theologians say yes and point out that this was, after all, the Mary who sat while Martha worked and leaned in to listen. This is the Mary that had the posture to go, I just want to learn from him. I want to spend time with him. I want to take cues from him. I want to respond not to just my desires for him, but to who he is because I trust him that much. The specific text doesn't name all she knew was going on, but it does describe how others viewed the gift. And more importantly, it describes how Jesus viewed this gift and how he responded to it, which leads to the second thing I'd like to look at, and that is Jesus' appropriate response to Mary, to her pouring out this offering. Jesus responds to Mary's act with some profound statements about what she's done. Let's look at the text again, Mark 14, starting in verse 4. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. And you can help them anytime you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the gospels preach throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. What I want to do is just walk through the different things Jesus says here, and we'll pause a little bit on each one to reflect. Firstly, leave her alone. She pours out this perfume. People rebuke her for it. And they defend their rebuke in a way that makes them sound moral. (laughs) But then Jesus rebukes them. He steps in and says, leave her alone. I just love how this highlights that Jesus is advocate. And he advocates for Mary. He comes to her defense. Jesus doesn't just stand by as she's being accused and mocked. And then he says, she has done a beautiful thing to me. He clearly doesn't think her gift or offering are excessive. Not at all. Neither did the girl who ended up marrying that guy, by the way. But um, (laughs) clearly. But Jesus sees her offering as something that makes sense. Jesus is moved by the gift. It lines up for him. And he admires her act. And then he says this line, The poor you will always have with you. And you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. It's a fascinating line. Maybe it's the one that got your attention as Jenna read it earlier. I think this one needs a little bit more fleshing out. (laughs) Of course, Jesus is not against giving to the poor. His ministry was to the poor. He loved the poor. He loves the poor. Scripture is filled with this truth. But admittedly, he seems somewhat dismissive of charity in this particular moment. And so I think it's good. we got to ask, what's going on here? And I think we get part of the answer by reading more of that account from John. Again, we can kind of Scripture interprets Scripture idea. John 12, starting in verse 4, one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who, later, who was later to betray him, objected, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wage. But then John, in his account, he just spells it out. Like any, any confusion, he's like, He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. 
Why? <laughs> Very helpful to be aware of that. Um, Judas isn't asking this because he cares about the poor. And so this is a uniquely gross look when you know what was going on behind the scenes. It's like when a modern day preacher preaches on a subject with passion and angst and moral superiority while living a life of total contradiction. Sometimes these people speak with particular angst about the very thing that they're warring against internally. I'm sure that's been me in some way or another in my life in ministry. And maybe Judas was verbally processing out of his inward angst and the turmoil of his own conscience. Regardless, it's deeply hypocritical. Yet, Jesus doesn't address this specifically. Instead, he says that they will always have the poor with them, but won't always have him. And I think Jesus is simply wanting to highlight something way more significant than their hypocrisy. Like, I like to think it's like, it's not even worthy of attention how pathetic that is. He wants to honor something way more significant. He's wanting to celebrate Mary and what she's responding to, that he's there amongst them, that he's about to go to the cross, that he won't be with them much longer. You'll always have the poor among you, but you'll not always have me. Because then Jesus says, she did what she could. He draws the attention to Mary. You feel that? She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. The NIV translates the beginning of verse 8, she did what she could. And in the Greek, this could more literally be translated, what she had, she did. I like that. She saw the unique opportunity she had to honor Christ in that moment, and she did something beautiful with what was in her hands. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. I bring, I'll play my drum for him, parampa pom pom. I bring my heart. He's the king. I'm going to bring what I have. What she had, she did. What was in her hands, she gave. What was in her heart, she poured out. And it was not only beautiful, It was purposeful, according to Jesus. Jesus says that her act prepared his body for burial. Jesus sees her act as timely. She discerns the moment right. I love that. Uh, I find that so, just draws me in. I go, man, what does that look like to be a disciple like that? Discern the moment right. Walk in a way where I'm so in cue. I get things right that worship the Lord even when others miss it. Mary got it. And this is what Jesus wants our attention to be on as we read the story. The hypocrisy of her critics is a secondary matter. Mary has worshipped rightly, and her worship is the focus of the story. It's as if Jesus is saying, learn from her. Learn from her example. It's like Mark is like, Look at Mary's example of discipleship. For then he says, this wonderful line, Truly I tell you, wherever the gospels preached throughout the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And I can't help but take a moment today and just recognize as I'm talking about this story and we're like remembering her in this small little way, we're part of fulfilling Jesus' actual words about what would take place in Vancouver in 2024. I mean, It's just like, even as I say it, I just get goosebumps. I'm like, oh my goodness, the words of our Lord in this moment, we get to proclaim the gospel in this city and we remember her example. But why does Jesus want us to remember her? I think primarily because Mary is an example of faith for all of us. Many are familiar with Gary Chapman's The Five Love Languages. Let's see if I got them. Words of affirmation, physical touch, um, acts of service, falling apart, quality time, uh, gifts. (laughs) And today I've mentioned stories that highlight Mary giving Jesus quality time, an extravagant gift, an act of service. But the more I spend time in scripture, the more I'm convinced that God's primary love language is not any one of these things in and of themselves. It's faith. It's faith that makes God feel loved to use that whole love languages thing. It's faith that moves his heart. As another text says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Faith pleases him. 
Faith makes him go, what a beautiful thing. He loves when we, in the middle of opposition and uncertainty, still worship him like he's the king of the universe. When we take him at his word, even with all the other voices we hear, and all the reasons we have to doubt, and we still respond to it like it's the realest thing in the world. And that leads me to point three, to venture to explore what might be our appropriate response to this story as disciples here and now in this city in our time. The past two weeks, Matt Hama has taught brilliantly on Mark 13. And uh, as if you've been around, as you've discovered, a lot said in Mark 13. Um, But in many ways, it's a chapter that highlights the coming destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, um, emphasizing in its context Israel's failure to worship God rightly. Perhaps you've noticed that bookending this chapter 13 are two stories about two women who worship God rightly. Beautiful. The widow's offering in Mark 12 and Mary's offering in Mark 14. In chapter 12, the widow throws in everything she had, literally the whole of her living into the treasury, and now Mary pours out everything she has upon Jesus. In other words, what Israel had gotten wrong, they had gotten right. Isn't it stunning writing? Stunning recording. It's like what, what Israel missed, it's not, full, it's not been fully missed. There's still people worshiping from the heart by faith. I just love the picture. And we're supposed to recognize in this the kind of worship God is looking for. Loving him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Giving out of all that we are, not just little bits that we choose. And some scholars think this is done intentionally and brilliantly by Mark. And no question, Mark as an expert narrator intentionally arranges certain parts of the story to make a point. Another example of this is that he puts the story of Mary right up next to the story of Judas betraying Jesus or taking steps towards betraying him. Maybe you notice that in, in the reading. And as we read it, we're meant to recognize the contrast between Judas and Mary. Like Mary takes all she has and pours it out on Jesus, and Judas takes what he has and uses it to betray Jesus. Mary listens to Jesus' plan and trusts him. Judas listens to Jesus' plan and decides, like, I like my plan better, and so decides to take matters into his own hands. Mary gives her wealth and the treasures of the earth to worship Jesus. Judas trades Jesus for the treasures of earth. Richard Foster argues this that Judas had charge of the money for the apostolic band and that money had eaten a hole in his heart. In addition, he was a zealot and he had hoped to force Jesus' hand to join the zealot cause. If Jesus were to be confronted by violent force, surely he would respond with supernatural violent force or so Judas thought, so he betrayed his master. A pers- interesting perspective. And fascinating to consider that Judas's greatest issue was lack of trust in God's way. A lack of faith in God's plan. Isn't that so often our issue as well? We get disappointed and disillusioned by what trust and obedience actually end up looking like for us. (laughs) And Mark wants us to consider whether or not we are more like Mary or more like Judas. I think that to appropriately, res- appropriately respond to this text is to allow our doubting, wayward, Judas-like hearts to be mentored by Mary. I think we're meant to take cues from her example. Studying this text personally the past couple weeks, I've been confronted by how my own heart can stray, and I've been impacted by Mary's trust in God. Just all the voices, all the criticism, all the stuff. She's like, I'm living for one. I'm responding to him. And so I've been asking myself, um, 
And I want to invite us to ask ourselves, what does it look like to live like Mary? To live with her memory and example front of mind. So here are a few final thoughts about what I think we can learn from Mary. We can learn to listen intently. I think being like Mary starts with being a good listener. I think, Daryl, I think you've said, right? Like the 101 of discipleship, being a good listener. Listen to him. Lean in. Hear. Ponder. Let it soak into your being. His words. His will. We can learn from Mary and become a people who firstly sit at his feet, though we're criticized for it. Who listen, who abide, who dwell. Who slow down enough to hear him and let it in. And what we realize from Mary is we're able to get to know him better than others. I know that sounds a bit funny, like I'm not trying to spark a weird (laughs) sense of competition. Um, It doesn't mean we're more saved than others. It doesn't mean we have more access than others. But it does mean that if we lay our agendas aside and listen to him, he will speak and he will lead and we will understand deep things about his heart and will that we may have missed. And that is striking. But a theme all over the place as you sit in Scripture In time, the prayer, take me deeper where my trust is without borders, can become a reality. And I think this story teaches us that the better we listen and the more we abide, the more we will bless him with our lives and decisions as we live by faith. And that was hopefully in a healthy way enticing for our hearts. Something else we can learn from Mary is we can learn to worship sacrificially. That sometimes worship means disrupting the status quo. We all love that. We all love that. History is filled with stories of men and women who have followed Mary's example and have lived lives of radical worship to God, some publicly, many privately, many stories never told. But um, there's a story about some Moravian men in their early 20s that I've always found so impacting. They boarded a ship out of conviction that Jesus was worth their all to go share the gospel with cannibal tribes. And they knew very likely they would lose their lives, not have their 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever they would have had. And as they looked um, off of the ship, they saw their loved ones standing on the shore, tears streaming down their face. And they famously cried out, shall the lamb that was slain not receive the reward of his suffering? He loves these people. (laughs) Should he not receive the reward of his suffering? And as I continue in my faith, I never want to grow content with living a culturally, um, a cultural Christianity. And for me, what I mean by cultural Christianity is this, I don't want to fall in the trap of I give 10% to the church, I go to church most Sundays, I attend a small group sometimes, and so I'm a good disciple. I've done my part. Church planting, we've taken hits. Deciding to put a stake in the ground and proclaim the gospel and move our lives to Vancouver. Um, I feel like I've taken personal hits. It's not been easy. And sometimes when things get hard, I'm tempted towards a weaker brand of Christianity. A weaker brand of worship. But this only happens when I get my eyes off of Jesus. When my eyes are on him my heart echoes the voice of the Moravians. I may lose my life. He's still worth it. I may lose a lot as I follow him. He's worthy. He will call us out of our comfort zone again and again and again, and sometimes we won't like it, but Mary reminds us we should keep worshiping. No response is too radical, for we, after all, have been saved by and are loved by the king of the universe. The text prompts us to ask, how much is too devotion, how much is, um, is too much devotion to Christ? A little oil, even expensive perfume is fine, but to break open a whole jar, doesn't that seem too extravagant? And Jesus would say no. And Mark would want us to look to Mary's example and conclude, no. As the hymn says, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. 
every last drop of me. He's worthy. And then lastly, we can learn from Mary to push past criticism. I think Mary's example reminds us there are times we'll have to push past mockery, being misunderstood. Criticism towards offerings like Mary's did not stop with Judas. (laughs) And so there are times we have to push past looking foolish. And when we worship from the heart, even other believers will at times misunderstand us and judge us. And to follow Mary's example is to not care at all what others think. What an inspiring disciple. As the Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 1.10, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. And we must offer worship even when our circumstances are shrouded in mystery, and they so often are. They so often are. Sometimes we won't understand what's happening. In Mary's case, perhaps her question was, why does he have to die? For us, it might be, why is following him leading me this direction? But when we don't fully understand what God's up to and still give our all to Jesus, we mirror Mary. And as we studied over Easter... When we trust God and pour our lives out regardless of circumstance, more than mirroring Mary, we mirror our own Lord. Who in the garden said, if it's possible, Father, take this cup from me. But not my will, but yours be done. And he poured himself out more fully than any of us could ever. Because of Christ's finished work and because of the resurrection, as we as a community faithfully worship him in our time, we can be confident that our faith and worship will not be forgotten. Isn't that beautiful? Hear these words from my heart to yours today. Our worship of Christ in our time will have a ripple effect for future generations. And it will echo into the halls of eternity. Any life poured out as an offering at Jesus' feet will not be wasted, whether no one sees it or everyone applauds it. A life poured out at the feet of Jesus will never be wasted, will not be forgotten. And as Mary's gift played a specific purpose in her time, so your faith and your worship of Jesus in this skeptical age, in this largely godless city, matters to the heart of the living God. What a thought it is to have Jesus one day say over our lives, what they have done is beautiful. Amen. Well, we hope that message was meaningful for you and drew you deeper into the Word of God and the love of Jesus. I want to leave you with this note that it's not too late to sign up to join us as a student at the Wake College this fall. For all the information about that and more, you can follow the links below. Tons of love. Bye for now.